Welcome to video 12. In this video, we're going to be looking at the forces acting on what's essentially a train. We have three blocks, M1, M2, M3. They're on a frictionless surface. The third block is pulled by a force F. You can think of that like a locomotive if you want. And we're going to look at the forces acting on each of the blocks and the acceleration of the whole system. So before we do this, I ask you to think, if the force F was 100 newtons, how many newtons do you think T1 and T2 would be? And when we get to the end of this, you may be a little surprised. So to start off with, we're going to have to pick a direction of positive acceleration. Relatively straightforward with this one. I'm going to pick this to the right as the direction of positive acceleration. Uh, we're going to label free body diagrams for each of the three blocks. So if I do that, we're going to see that you're going to have mass 1 is just simply going to have a tension. Now I do want to say that each of these do have a normal force and a weight force, but we know that they cancel out because the train isn't going up into the air and it's not going down into the ground. It's certainly not accelerating vertically. So for block number one, it just has simply tension one. For block number two, it just has tension two to the right and tension two, I'm sorry, tension one to the left, tension two to the right. And the third block also has two forces. It has the F pointing to the right, so the force that's on the front car, minus tension 2. So this is M1, M2, M3. And of course, all of these three objects all have the same acceleration. So let me go ahead and copy this and bring this to the next page. So here's the free body diagram we want to keep in mind. I'll just redraw that one. So when we use Newton's second law for the first object, the sum of the forces on object 1 is going to be equal to tension 1. That's the only force in the horizontal direction. and That's going to equal M1A. And we're going to look at the second object over here. That's going to be T2 minus T1 equals M2A. And then we're going to look at the third object, which is going to be force minus T2 equals M3A. And now we're going to try to eliminate these tensions and get an expression that just has the acceleration, the masses, and the force in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this tension, tension 1, and I'm going to plug it in here. That's going to give me T2 minus M1A equals M2A, or T2 equals M1 plus M2 times A. So I simply brought over this term by adding M1A to both sides, and then I factored out the A. Remember, we like to get the A's um, factored out if possible. Now I'm going to take this tension 2, and I'm going to plug it in here, and we're going to get force minus M1 plus M2 A equals M3 A. Now, when I bring this over to the right side, this is the same as adding M1A and adding M2A. When we factor out the A, you should get M1 plus M2 plus M3 times A. And that makes sense. If you're thinking of the three cars as being one object that has a mass that's equal to the three of them combined, you'd expect F net equals the total mass times the net acceleration. The acceleration being um, the same for each of them. But we were asked to solve for the acceleration. So if I'm going to solve for the acceleration, I'm simply going to divide over, and the acceleration is going to be F divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. So this is the acceleration of the system. Now let's look at the tensions. 
to do that, I'm simply going to plug this acceleration in to tension one. So tension one is going to be m1 times, well, if I factor out the f, you can think of it as m1 over m1 plus m2 plus m3 times f. And I like to do it this way because you can express the tension as some fraction of the force being applied to the front car. Similarly, tension 2 is going to be equal to m1 plus m2 over m1 plus m2 plus m3 times the f. Again, all I did is for this a, I plugged in this formula over here for the acceleration, this expression. And then uh, we have t1, we have t2, we have t3. It's worth considering, well, what happens if m1 is really big? In other words, if the caboose, the last car, is really, really huge, well, this is going to simplify to t1 equals huge over huge plus some other little stuff times F. In other words, the tension acting on the back car is essentially the same as the force that's being applied to the first car. So these first two masses don't really change this tension a whole lot if the back car is really, really huge. Now as far as tension 2, you can imagine, well, if M1 is huge, you're going to wind up with uh, huge over huge again, and you're going up with a tension that is also essentially the same as the pulling force. Now, what happens if uh, M3 is huge? So, if M3 is huge, for tension 1, you're going to wind up with essentially 0 over m1 plus m2 plus m3. The same thing with tension 2. You're going to get 0. And that makes sense. If this first mass is huge and these are really small, it's not going to require much force to, to pull them along. So in the limiting case where m1 is huge, you get a tension 1 uh, and a tension 2 that are essentially equal to the pulling force, whereas if the front car is huge, tension 1 and tension 2 are effectively 0. Now, to put this in perspective, let's, let's look at some numbers. If I want to calculate the acceleration uh, where these are a force of 100 newtons over 10 kg plus 10 kg plus 10 kg, that's going to give us an acceleration that is 3.33 meters per second squared. Fair enough. Tension 1 is going to be equal to m1, which is 10 kg over 10 kg plus 10 kg plus 10 kg, which is going uh, times f, which is going to give you one third of the pulling force, or 33.3 .3 newtons. Tension 2 is going to be equal to 10 kilograms plus 10 kilograms over 10 plus 10 plus 10 times F is going to give you two-thirds of the pulling force, or 66 newtons. So when you look at this, the tensions are not the same. Because you can think of the objects behind the tension force almost as if they're one object, so the force required to move object 1 is less than the force required to move object 1 and 2, which is less than the force to require objects 1, 2, and 3. Now, since each of these is the same mass, F has to pull all three. Well, tension 2 only has to pull two of the three, so the tension here is only two-thirds of the pulling force. Tension 1 only has to pull one of these three equal masses, so it's going to be one-third of the force required to pull all three. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, I hope that, as always, you find this video 
helpful. And if not, hit stop.